In Japan, compact was cool. Shooting games were cool. RPGs were cool. So in Japan, the PC Engine was cool. However, these same features that made it such a darling in Japan is also what sunk the PC Engine when it took the show on the road to the USA. What was cool in Japan was not in the West. It was late 80s Murica, home of Rambo and Transformers. Things like anime and manga were still obscure. We loved things with an edge. Contact sports, comic books, and superheroes. Yet, NEC was riding high. The PC Engine was an unmitigated success. America was next and ripe for the taking. But things didn't go as planned. Theories abound on what happened and why the system failed. There's just one thing. They're mostly rubbish. Would you like to hear the big secret? Do you want to know what really happened? Are you ready for the truth? Our communication to Hudson Tower has been cut off. What should we do to stop this rogue? This caveman presents an interesting challenge. Let's see how far this Genjin character can go before we crush him. NEC felt they had the winning lottery ticket. With the Mega Drive in Japan unable to outpace the PC Engine, NEC expected an easy win. So what went wrong? How did they take that winning lottery ticket, piss on it, and throw it away? Was it all really NEC's fault? Or was there more to it? It's no big secret that NEC Japan and Hudson didn't understand the US market or how to gather support from publishers. During their very first developer conference, Hudson chose to focus on the very expensive CD system and failed to interest a single publisher. They did, however, manage to piss off Electronic Arts questioning if they were up to the task of developing good games for their CD. How dare you? Do you know who we are? No sports for you! They walked out. Having failed to secure any third-party support, NEC chose to go it alone. Get over here! It's also no secret that NEC of America was overconfident. They thought they had it in the bag. The hype was real. Early reactions by the gaming press and retailers was positive. They were convinced that success was imminent. 750,000 units were manufactured to keep up with expected demand, spending a huge portion of their advertising budget. Yet NEC had lost their advantage to sell the system early by redesigning the look to appeal to American kids. Instead of launching several months early, they ended up launching two weeks after the Sega Genesis. NEC continued to make many mistakes from their poor choice of launch game, Keith Courage, instead of the arcade hit, R-Type to releasing the CD system at too high a price with no game included and only two total games in the library. Most kids that asked for one likely got the same answer. You know we love you, Timmy. We love you very much, but not that much. <laughs> 
and yet, not all was bad. The TurboGrafx launch lineup was objectively superior to the Genesis. Maybe not the cover art. Sega killed it there, but there was no lack of titles or quality. Had the launch gone well and NEC gained confidence to reinvest more into marketing, the early mistakes could have gone unpunished and may have even been rectified. But it did not go well. It wasn't the lack of big name games. It wasn't the lack of a second controller port needing a $20 adapter, nor was it confusing advertising. All of these things did matter, of course, and they did contribute, along with many other mistakes by NEC. But NEC wasn't the only reason, or the biggest reason, the TurboGrafx launch went poorly. They could have launched sooner, made less mistakes, and sold much more. They could have put up a fight, but no matter what they did, they were destined for third place from the start. For one main reason, the big reason. Genesis done. 16-bit arcade graphics. You can't do this on Nintendo. Genesis done. 16-bit sports action. You can't do this on Nintendo. Genesis does. Genesis does. Genesis does. Genesis does. Genesis does. Sega, the one NEC trounced and outsold in Japan. Yep, the underdog. In 1990, Sega of America and new CEO Tom Kalinske convinced Sega of Japan to do things his way, and along with marketing director Al Nilsson, rolled out one of the most remembered, brilliant campaigns in gaming history. Everything Sega failed to do in Japan, veteran Tom Kalinske executed near flawlessly in the largest market in the world. Sega geared their entire lineup around the games American kids wanted. I heard Mac got a Sega Genesis. I heard Mac got a Sega Genesis. That's how you sell systems, boys and girls, and aggressively compete against the current monopoly in the industry. In the early 90s, games were mostly played by kids. Most parents knew little to nothing about the systems. We knew, oh we knew, exactly what we wanted. From TV, from the magazines, from friends, and we made sure our parents knew too, assuming they could afford it. They knew what to buy the moment they walked into the store. And if you begged for a Genesis, God help them if they brought home something else. Sega, through their brilliant marketing and targeted library of games for the American market, made sure that 9 out of 10 kids wanted the Genesis. Not even the mighty Nintendo that released the following year was ultimately able to dethrone Sega in North America. Despite NEC's mistakes, and there were many, they were always destined for third. A clueless NEC and the wrong marketing staff against former CEO of Mattel that revived the Barbie and Hot Wheels brands. You do the math. Had the roles been reversed and CEO Kalinske running the NEC campaign with those ads, with electronic arts and all the third-party support, no single controller port, no expensive CD, no poor launch choice or other factors would have stopped him from blowing open the market. It was less about what NEC did wrong and more about what Sega did right. Sega! But was the Turbo Graphics a complete failure? What makes a console a failure? Is it simply commercial success? Or is it about the library of games and how it's remembered decades after its release? 
without Kalinske at the helm in the US, was the Sega Saturn a failure? Was the Dreamcast a failure? Some would say yes, but many would say no. Neither of Sega's last two consoles sold more than the PC Engine, yet both are fondly remembered and claimed as all-time favorites. It's because their library of games has stood the test of time and left a legion of fans in their wake. Within just two months of launch, the TurboGrafx saw the release of some of its killer apps with Blazing Lasers, a bona fide classic, along with other shooters, Fantasy Zone, Dragon Spirit, and Sidearms. The following year saw many more releases of Bonk's Adventure, Natopia, Bloody Wolf, the controversial Splatterhouse that had the magazines abuzz with its previously unseen blood and gore in a video game. There was Devil's Crush, still the greatest pinball game of all time. Ninja Spirit, a wonderful Irem arcade port that never released elsewhere and the follow-up to the popular launch title, Legendary Axe 2. That year also saw the release of the incredible Easebook 1 and 2 on CD. There was the revolutionary portable system, the Turbo Express, that played the exact same Hue card games as the main console at home, so you could take your same games with you on the road. Just like the CD, it was ahead of its time and the first system to ever do so. Despite some good Japanese games never making it to US shores, many more good game releases continued. But the quality titles alone weren't enough. NEC never recovered from their own mistakes. Third-party publishers remained nearly non-existent. Their marketing budget was overspent from day one. Sega ensured that most kids wanted a Genesis in their home, and the subsequent release of the Super Nintendo only put the nail in the coffin. Faced with mounting losses, they pulled out what little support they had left. NEC was, however, an honorable company, and simply abandoning those who invested in their system was not on the table. Unlike NEC, Hudson had made plenty of money on the Turbo Graphics, despite its poor sales. Paid royalties by NEC for every console they manufactured and every Hue card that was sold. Hudson had far less to lose. A new company was formed in 1992, Turbo Technologies Inc., allowing NEC of America to pull out. Taking a step in the right direction, they released the Turbo Duo, a more powerful and cost-effective unit with the latest RAM upgrade and built-in CD. Instead of marketing to younger kids, as NEC did, they went for an older crowd and imported the most popular and universal games from Japan, like both Gate and Lords of Thunder. Despite their now limited budget, they found creative ways to market the system such as getting Tony Hawk to develop a garage style, low budget VHS tape, marketing Lords of Thunder as the must have game. I already have Sega, but it's pretty traded in for this. My favorite 
favorite game. In fact, ever since my baby's been born, that's all I do. I like to play the game. What do you, what do you like Lord, about Lords of Thunder? The lyrics. The lyrics? Huh? Turbo Technologies, or TTI, was far more than some dummy wholesaler. Not just a company that NEC simply used to dump their remaining stock. They were run by Hudson staffers that flew in from Japan and a very passionate team of enthusiasts such as John Brandstetter, aka Johnny Turbo, that truly loved the system, understood Japan's library of games, and wanted to do everything in their power to succeed. Headquartered in Los Angeles, California, my hometown, I was at ground zero during TTI's operations. They knew the system. They knew the games. Each year, they presented NEC of Japan with a plan and their list of games they knew were the best choices to localize. And yet, NEC of Japan remained an obstacle. Every year, TTI was lucky to get one or two of their wish list approved. An incredible port of Street Fighter II by Capcom themselves, denied. The greatest Castlevania of the 16-bit generation, possibly ever, Rondo of Blood. It sold like crazy in the gray market through import stores to everyone who owned a duo. Denied. They brokered a deal to get Mortal Kombat, just released in arcades in 92, to be ported to the system, a guaranteed seller. Denied. NEC of Japan remained a roadblock, no longer willing to invest funds. It was TTI that came up with the idea for an even more powerful arcade RAM card and to release popular SNK ports on the system. Yet NEC of Japan turned them down again, only to then turn around and use their idea and release it in Japan, along with those impressive SNK ports. When TTI was founded, said Brandstetter, we thought we had the freedom, but we still had the boat anchor of Japan. Both the Hudson staff and TTI really wanted it to work, and their passion created an unexpected spark. But Japan was no longer interested. It was too little, too late. The support was gone, and TTI officially closed in 1994, bringing the saga of the Turbo Graphics in North America to an end. So is this how it ends? With a whimper? Kids around the world, from America to Europe, cut off and at Japan's mercy. Never able to enjoy some of the greatest games of the 16-bit era, only to read about them as fairy tales, and never get to experience them again? Come on, what do you think? Great game systems that stand the test of time for decades forward don't do so because of the most powerful hardware, or because they sold millions of copies, or because they won their era of console war. It's about the games, stupid, and the great developers behind them. Always has been, always will be.
Whether you played it in Japan, in America, or around the world, in France, the UK, or anywhere else it never released, gamers refused to accept any sea of Japan's scraps and found ways to support Hudson's amazing console through import stores and magazines we could buy, trade, even rent nearly any game released and enjoy the entire catalog of the amazing PC Engine. Even with the huge popularity of the Super Famicom in Japan, the PC Engine continued as a solid number two toward the end of its life, and Hudson continued making a ton of games for them. Then for the Saturn, the Dreamcast, the Nintendo 64, the GameCube, the Wii, and for portables, Sony's PlayStation consoles, and later for mobile phones. And yes, they even had train tracks and a mini train that you could ride around the headquarters like it was Disneyland. They were that kind of company. They experimented and had fun. Hudson was always about the games, played nice with everyone, never greedy or exclusive. And it's why they made so many friends throughout the industry. Despite some big missteps along the way, in 2012, they jointly decided on a voluntary merger and officially became one with Konami. Just over one year ago, in 2020, Konami released the PC Engine Mini for even more around the world to play and experience some of the fantastic games. But just as in America, it was only a taste of the massive library waiting to be discovered. Those of us who played it growing up, we knew what everyone else was missing. Because of the incredible work by Hudson and everyone else that supported them, and the support we continue to show today, teaching new generations how wonderful these games were, the PC Engine will continue to live on, not just in our memories, but in game rooms worldwide, new fans and old, making sure that the memory of Hudson's little engine that could has its rightful place in history and will never be forgotten.